everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you're having a nice day. In today's episode, I'll tell you a joke, we'll go over the expression to take it with a grain of salt, and we'll do a pronunciation exercise. In part two of today's lesson, we'll do another English story using 10 irregular past tense verbs. The story will be about McDonald's. I'm guessing you know what McDonald's is. Be sure to stay tuned for that. Before we begin today's lesson, let's do a recap. Last week, I posted an episode all about culture shock in the U.S. And you guys shared so many fun things about your experiences in the United States related to culture shock, both on Instagram and in Spotify comments. Some of you sent me personal messages. Thank you for contributing. Culture shock is experienced differently by different people, and it was so fun to read through your commentary. I'm going to read through some of the messages I received. Bear with me. I have quite a few that I'd like to comment on and to just share with you because they were so good. And we'll get to the bulk of the episode after this. So I've corrected these messages just little grammar mistakes here and there to make sure that you hear the correct English version of these responses. We'll start out with Joana Salvado from Portugal. And she wrote, Hi, Shauna. I'm from Portugal. Love your podcast. And it's been helping me a lot. I've been to New York and I saw some ads on TV for prescription medicines. We don't have that here in Portugal. It's forbidden. Joanna, you are 100% right. It is allowed in the United States. When I was a kid, I remember these ads were intense, more intense than today. So apart from strong visuals and music, the ads ended with the spokesperson reading a list of 20 or more negative side effects so fast you could barely understand it. Today is a little bit different. It's still permitted on TV, of course, but these medicine commercials are regulated a little bit more heavily by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And supposedly, nowadays, (laughs) the person who is creating the ad needs to speak understandably for consumers, so they can't use fancy or technical language. They also have to say the drug name and major side effects clearly and coherently at a normal pace. This drug can cause a heart attack, lung cancer, stroke. You get the idea. Do you guys have ads for medicine on TV? Honestly, it's so normal here. I've never really thought about it. Then we have Danielle or Daniel, I'm not quite sure from Bologna, Italy, and he said, I lived in the U.S. for two years, and I found it weird that you're able to buy a screwdriver in a pharmacy. (laughs) For example, at CVS, Walgreens. Yeah, you're so right. A lot of name brand pharmacies have become like convenience stores. In other words, you can solve a lot of your problems there in addition to getting your medicine. So yeah, if you need makeup, slippers, or maybe a screwdriver, check out your local pharmacy. That's a good one. One listener commented on the size of our trucks. They're big. Another on our lack of tradition and food culture. The Sea Dreams 420. I guess that's his or her screen name, found that the no firearm signs at entrances is surprising. Do you know what a firearm is? It's a gun. 
And what you should know about the U.S. is that while we have the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is the right to own a gun or a firearm, each state has different laws about which guns are allowed and how they're obtained. More conservative states, or the red states, tend to be more relaxed when it comes to gun laws. And at least from my experience, these no firearm signs that um, C Dreams 420 mentioned are more common in these conservative states where it's easier to get guns. It's a little alarming. I know I felt the same way traveling from California to Texas and from California to North Carolina. I totally get it. I'll do an episode on this controversial topic in the future, for sure. A lot of you commented on restaurant culture in the U.S. Nana from France said she was surprised by the buzzers or beeper that they give you at restaurants to wait your turn. And she was surprised that people in Florida wait patiently for what seems like hours. In France, if a restaurant is crowded, people just go to a different one. There are no buzzers. Fascinating point. Nana, I never thought about this not existing elsewhere. It's kind of random, and I love these little random tidbits. We really appreciate you sharing. So then you get to the restaurant, you get your buzzer, you get called to your table, and then it's mealtime. Evelyn from Brazil mentioned, in most places in the U.S., you eat one dish, one drink, and the waiter brings you the bill. That's it. Bye. Very well said, Evelyn. You're right. It's not as common in regular restaurants, so not fancy restaurants, to order more and more food and drinks and hang out for hours on end. I feel we're pretty rushed. I think there are a few reasons why waiters and waitresses give us the check so early on in the dining experience. Number one, I think they are eager to get more customers at their tables because more customers means more tips. Obviously, this depends on the state because tipping laws are different in different states. I did an episode on tipping before. I'll post it in the episode notes. Or maybe they just bring the check early so that the paying process gets started. After the meal, it'll be quick and smooth. Maybe that's why. I do agree it prevents customers from ordering more. Maybe they won't even get dessert because they weren't asked. How do you feel about waiters and waitresses bringing you the check or the bill when you aren't even done eating? Do you feel rushed? Evelyn, I'm with you on this one. I don't like feeling rushed. And that brings me to the next point. At the end of the meal, Nat from Brazil said, What I found different in the U.S. was the fact that the waiter took the credit card inside to charge. Not used to this at all. Yeah. So in the U.S., the waiter brings the check or the bill, maybe during the meal, maybe after the meal. You leave your card. They bring it back to their machine. They swipe it. Then they bring you a receipt, which you sign. You leave the tip and then you leave the restaurant. It's a long process. <laughs> it can be, at least. In Brazil, on the other hand, waiters have a little machine that they bring to the table. You swipe or tap your card to pay, and then voila, you're done. It's very fast, very efficient. Honestly, I'm surprised that this little machine doesn't exist in the U.S. Or if it does, I guess it's not everywhere. It would certainly solve the last problem we just discussed about waiters and waitresses rushing us. Don't you think? It would be so rude if a waiter or waitress just showed up with that machine mid-meal and forced customers to pay. I don't think that would ever happen anywhere, right? So this is a good idea. This is a business idea. Whoever is listening and wants to universalize the little payment machine in the U.S. restaurants, I guarantee this is going to be a hit. Love it. 
There were so many other comments I could read through, but I really want to get to today's episode. Let's jump to the last few. On Spotify, I was able to conduct a poll with the question, which cultural impressions of the U.S. can you relate to or agree with? I provided seven different random aspects from tipping to our air conditioning. And uh, the cultural impressions you most agreed with were, number one, 19% of you said our portion sizes are huge. Number two, 22% of you said there are flags everywhere. Charlie, who I believe is originally from Argentina, but now lives in Miami, said, Hi, Shauna, I have just listened to your last episode, and you couldn't have been more accurate when you talked about the cultural point regarding the flags in the U.S. I remember when my daughters were just kids and they were traveling in the back seats of the truck. They would play a game of counting flags on each side of the road for the whole journey. So at the end, the one who had counted more flags won the round. So for us being aliens in the U.S., it was always funny to see the amount of flags that you guys display on the streets, being that on buildings, used car lots, banks, or whatever premises you can imagine. Now, Charlie went on to say that he thinks it's a positive side of American culture, that people have a deep sense of pride and connection to our country. How do you feel about raising flags? Do you like it? Do you think it's positive? Something to think about. Once again, thanks for all of the comments on culture. I really appreciate it. Even the somewhat negative comments were interesting. I took them with a grain of salt. Which brings me to today's episode about the expression to take something with a grain of salt. Let's begin with a joke. Are you ready? Why did the hamburger go to the gym? Do you know? It wanted buns of steel. As you probably know, there are multiple parts of a hamburger. I know you know the meaning of cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, onion. But do you know what the flat, round piece of meat or ground vegetables in the middle is called? A patty. What about the bread on the outside? A bun. Standard burgers, your regular old burger, has a bun. But buns has a second meaning. It's another way to say butt, your gluteus maximus, your rear end, your behind, your booty. Old workout videos, I remember my mom watching way back when, would be like, do this exercise and you will have buns of steel. In other words, a really hard, firm booty. (laughs) It's just a very funny way to say it. He has buns of steel. Steel is, of course, the hard metal. Let's hear the joke one more time. Why did the hamburger go to the gym? Do you know? It wanted buns of steel. (laughs) Hope that makes sense. Once again, I tell these jokes not for you to die laughing but to understand some wordplay. English has a lot of homonyms. A homonym is a word that has the same spelling and or pronunciation as another word, but has a different meaning, which is wordplay. Let's move to the expression of the day, which is to take something with a grain of salt or to take it with a grain of salt. We'll do the individual word definitions first. To take. To take is a verb that means to reach for and hold. He took a box of cereal from the shelf and placed it in his basket. Something is a pronoun. This is just a placeholder. We'll skip this one for now. With is a preposition. It means accompanied by. She went to the party with her friends. A is an indefinite article used to indicate one out of several people or things. She bought a new book yesterday. Grain is a noun. It's a small, hard seed or the fruits of cereal plants. 
How many grains of rice are in this bag? I don't know. Probably a thousand? Of is a preposition expressing the relationship between a part and a whole. A slice of pizza is enough for me. And salt is a noun. It's a crystalline substance, typically white, consisting of sodium chloride. He sprinkled some salt on his fries before eating them. To take something with a grain of salt means to view something with skepticism or not to fully believe it. It suggests that information or a statement should be considered carefully and critically. When reading Wikipedia, it's best to take the information with a grain of salt until it is confirmed by a reliable source. In other words, don't blindly accept the information you read on Wikipedia. Take it with a grain of salt. Be skeptical. Where does this expression or idiom come from? The phrase to take something with a grain of salt has its origins in ancient Roman times. The Roman author Pliny the Elder documented an antidote for poison in his work Naturales Historia, or Natural History. He suggested that if someone were to ingest a toxic substance, they should consume a small amount of salt with it to neutralize the poison's effects. Over time, this advice evolved into a figurative expression, suggesting that when receiving information or advice that might be questionable or exaggerated, one should metaphorically take it with a grain of salt to approach it with skepticism. Now, the phrase gained popularity in English during the 17th century. It appeared in various writings, including John Trapp's commentary on the Old and New Testaments in 1647. Since then, it's become very common. Let's go through some examples. Example number one, celebrity gossip. Do you know what a tabloid is? It's a magazine that you usually find at the front of a grocery store, at least in the U.S., that talks about pop culture. When reading rumors about celebrity breakups in tabloid magazines, it's wise to take them with a grain of salt. In other words, don't believe the stories you read as truth. Be a little skeptical until the rumors are confirmed by the celebrities or their representatives. Remember, tabloids are businesses, so the crazier the headlines, the more eyes they get, possibly the more money they make. So you got to take them with a grain of salt. Number two, occasionally I scroll through Instagram and I see a celebrity endorse a product. For example, I recently saw Jan, um, I don't know her name in real life, the character from The Office. Do you remember her? Anyway, she was in an ad for Il Maquillage, a makeup company. My thought was, really? Does she really use this product? I'm skeptical. When a celebrity endorses a product, I always take it with a grain of salt. In other words, I'm not sure if it's genuine or simply a paid promotion. Do you take ads with a grain of salt? Are you skeptical about their authenticity? Now, don't get me even started about social media. There are so many things we should take with a grain of salt. For example, a blogger whose life seems perfect. No, 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 no. Behind perfect pictures, in my mind, there are dirty bathrooms, messy kitchens, piles of laundry, a bunch of stuff the photos don't show. Take them with a grain of salt. Now, to be honest, I really like this expression. Last week, I posted that episode about culture shock, and before posting it, I was insecure. The internet is a jungle, it's a wild place, and there's a lot of judgment on people who share their opinions, especially when they're a bit controversial. All I could think before publishing was, 
Please, please take my opinions with a grain of salt. Don't blindly accept what I'm saying as truth because they're opinions. They're subjective. You have your own opinion. That's cool. Please take mine with a grain of salt. Don't take it seriously. Be skeptical. Be a critical thinker. Let's begin the pronunciation exercise. Repeat after me. Please. Please take it. Please take it with a grain of salt. Please take it with a grain of salt. And the conjugation, repeat after me. I took it with a grain of salt. You took it with a grain of salt. She took it with a grain of salt. He took it with a grain of salt. It took it with a grain of salt. We took it with a grain of salt. They took it with a grain of salt. When we take things with a grain of salt, we get less upset by them. Life is easier. That's it for this episode. Be sure to stay tuned for next week's episode, which is an irregular verb lesson with McDonald's as the story. Stay tuned for that. Until then, I highly recommend watching the movie The Founder, all about the founding and expansion of McDonald's. It's a fantastic film. Although, once again, take my opinion with a grain of salt. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.